And if we serve a good God, let me see how far, if I got to go past that. Yeah. Is because he wants you to run after him. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God, listen, Yahweh wants you running after him. Amen. And not running after this. An elusive sensation. Wow. You see, I don't know if you ever have seen this, the donkey and the stick. Yeah. So this is how they would get a donkey to go forward, right? They would put a carrot on the stick, as you see in front of the donkey. And the donkey would want the sensation and the satisfaction of eating the carrot. But it's tied to the stick and it's always going to be in front of them. So what they would do is they would just give the donkey a nudge in the back, say, giddy up. And if the donkey was stubborn, they'd put this carrot out in front of them, Come on. in front of the donkey, and cause the donkey to always be looking at the carrot. Wow. wow. And it's an elusive seduction. Okay? okay? Yes. And so Yahweh wants you and I not to fall prey to elusive seductions. Amen. So I'm going to break this down for you so you can thoroughly understand. Wow. Because what you're about ready to see is an elusive seduction is something that is, is used by something that is called serpent wisdom. Wow. Okay. See, Jesus said, I send you out a sheep among wolves. That's a losing proposition. Sheep cannot be wolves. Right. A sheep yeah. cannot be the wolf. He says, therefore, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So the serpent has wisdom that he uses against us that we don't even know that we're being played by the serpent. Okay. Like the woman did not know she was being played by the serpent in the garden of Eden. Right. And so we have to recognize every element to the best of our ability that Holy Spirit will show us of serpent wisdom. And elusive seductions is one of his greatest weapons. Not the only one, but it's a great weapon. Okay. So let's break this down. First of all, in order for us to really get an understanding, let's look at the word elusive and break that word down. And then we're going to look at the word sensation. And I, was, I know I said seduction, but it's sensation. And then we'll put them together so we got, have a really good understanding, okay? So the word elusive means this. It's difficult to find, mm -hmm. it's difficult to catch, or it's difficult to achieve. Wow. Now, here's the key. This is how it works. The key to anything being elusive is this. It's the appearance that it's attainable. Mm -hmm. Remember, the carrot is right there in front of the donkey's face. Right, 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 right. So it looks attainable, right? right? But as long as the donkey moves, the carrot moves too. Mm. Wow, right. You see? Right. So yeah. it's attainable. So let's break that down again. It's difficult to either find, it's difficult to catch, or it's difficult to attain, though it can be found, though it can be caught, and though it can be attained. Mm. Yeah. Now, let's look at the second part, the second word, sensation. Sensation is a physical feeling or perception resulting from something that happens. So a sensation ha uh, uh, is the key. Okay, let me see. Let me stay on my notes. The key to sensationalism, listen, is the feeling or perception that you would get once you have what is elusive. So it's this feeling that Boy, when I get that, everything is going to be great. Yeah. When I have this in my life, it's going to be so, my life is going to be so happy. It's going to be so full of pleasant things yeah. when this deal happens. Uh -huh. But it's elusive. Why? It's difficult, all right? So let's put those two words together so we can have the proper understanding for the teaching that Yahweh wants us to have today. An elusive seduction is this. It is designed, listen, is designed to create an anticipated, personalized, wow. which means it knows you and knows what you are desiring. It's designed to create an anticipated, personalized, beneficial feeling or perception that comes from you achieving an attainable event, though the event is difficult to find, is difficult to catch, or is difficult to achieve. Are you with me? So, in other words, an elusive sensation is always putting pleasure in some way, some form, some fashion before you. And you're like, yes, that's what I want. Because when I get that, boy, my life is going to be so good. 
And we keep running after it, running after it, running after it. But we either don't get it, or listen, when we get it, it's not everything it was cracked up to be. Wow. Wow. I mean, it was good for that one moment of pleasure, for that one check, for that one moment of happiness, not joy, happiness. It was, it was good for that moment or for that short season. But then all of a sudden, it's gone and we're left empty. You see, the whole goal of an elusive sensation, church, is this. The whole goal of an elusive sensation, the serpent wisdom of an elusive sensation is to have you fall in love with lust. Is to have you fall in love with lust. Wow. Let me prove it out. Turn with me in your in your swords to the uh, epistle of 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verse number 15 and 16. Remember, it's to have you fall in love with lust. Now, lust is never satisfied. Lust can't be satisfied because lust is too selfish to be satisfied. It's an internal ravaging selfishness that once it gets what it was trying to get and it would get it at any means necessary or by any means necessary. Once it gets it, it's always seeking for something greater in that area of what it just got. It's wow. never satisfied. Come on. So the whole goal of an elusive sensation is to have you and I fall in love with lust. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15, John says, gives us this wisdom. He says, do not, notice what he says, love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. Now notice what he says. So John says we can fall in love with the world. We are falling in love with the world. But then he goes on to verse number 16 and he breaks down what this love would lead you into. He says this, for all that is in the world, look at it. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. Number three, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So if we fall in love with the world, we are falling in love with lust. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when an elusive sensation is thrown before us in a way that it, it, it excites a bit of perception of benefit, but it comes from, and I'm going to break these down, when it comes from the world, we are literally going after something that will never satisfy us and never will because it's not of the Father. It's of the world. Let's break it down. See, let me show you how serpent wisdom causes you and I to fall in love with lust. First of all, he says this. He says in verse number 16, he says that the first thing he wants us to do is to fall in love with the world. This is how, listen, listen to me. This is how he causes us to fall in love with us. Number one, he causes us to fall in love with the world. Now the word love, in, in Greek there is many words for love. This particular word for love is the word agape. It means to take pleasure in, and it means to long for. So in other words, the first seduction that the world would give us to fall in love with us is to fall in love with the world. Wow. In other words, it's accept acceptance and then embracing secular ideologies. That's it. The word secular, and I'm going to go deep. The word secular means no religious or spiritual basis. So the world will throw out things to you to make you fall in love with, love with that will appear to give you a benefit, appear to make you feel good, appear to make you feel uh, 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 like you arrived, quote unquote. 
However, there's no religious or spiritual basis to it. Zero. It's all secular. It's all of the world. And he makes us fall in love with it. So what is fall in love? How do we fall in love? The first thing we have to do is we have to accept it. When I met my wife and I started to fall in love with my wife, I accepted her first as somebody who's attractive, somebody who I was pleased to be around, somebody I was pleased to be with. And as I was around her more and more and more, I wanted to then not only fall in love, I wanted part of the next phase was to embrace her, to bring her closer into my life, to bring her closer into what? My heart. That's what the world system wants you to do. It wants you to embrace. Listen, it wants you to embrace something that looks good to you, that will think that you think will make your life fulfilled and complete, and that when you accept it, then you will bring it closer into you so that you will hold it in your heart. And when you start holding it and you're holding it in your heart and you start going after it, listen, listen, you're starting to fall in love with the world. No God in it whatsoever. There's no spirituality in it whatsoever. And how do you know that? Because it's satisfying the flesh, but not causing your spirit man to grow. Uh, oh, it's good to the flesh. Yeah, yeah. You know, the flesh loves it. Mm -hmm. Loves watching it. Loves eating it. Loves drinking it. Loves doing it. The flesh loves it. Mm -hmm. But the spirit man is not growing. Right. Mm -hmm. We're falling in love with the world. But it doesn't stop there. That's only the first step. Step number two is this. Once we fall in love with the world, then it says, he says in verse 15, do not love the world, listen, or the things in the world. So what this falling in love process does, it causes us to be introduced to things that are from the world system, won't grow your spirit, but it will definitely satisfy your flesh. And we start embracing those things and, want, and wanting and going after those things just like the carrot in front of the donkey's face. And we start running after it. Yeah, boy, when I get that Louis Vuitton, oh, when I drive this type of car, oh, when I live in this type of house, oh, when I have this type of money in my bank account, oh, when I find this man, oh, when I find this type of woman. Because why? We're seeing it on TV. We're seeing it in the movies. We're seeing it on our smartphones. We're seeing we're falling in love with it and we're constantly pursuing that carrot. Thinking when we get it. When it finally comes in my life, when I have this, my life is going to be so joyful. So happy. Because that's what it shows us that our lives will be. Yeah, I think the epitome of it is when we see pharmaceutical commercials, right? You see people on those pharmaceutical commercials, you know? You know, the one that blows me away is the ones for mental health. And, and let's say, I'm not against anything that somebody has to take in order to maintain equilibrium in their body. And that's a whole other teacher. However, but the ones for mental health, they said, you know, they show the people happy, you know, joyful. And then they read the side effects right there on in the commercial. And you know what? One of the side effects are suicidal thoughts. Hello? Come on. But we get wrapped up in the smiling faces. Wow. We get wrapped up in the perception that that's how our life will be. Come on. Yes. yes. Teach. Yes. Come on, and it causes us to run after an elusive sensation. Wow. But it doesn't stop there. Once we fall in love with the world, and then we start falling in love with the things of the world, notice the next one. He says, if anyone loves the world, listen. The love of the Father is not in him. The third step of this serpent wisdom, listen, is to start eliminating the love of the Father from your life. We love the world. Love the things of the world. And they become more important that we're chasing after them. That the love of the Father and for the Father starts to diminish. Start to get smaller. And smaller and smaller to the point where the love of the world and the love of things of the world are so commonplace in our life. It's so what we're running after so much that we don't even think about reestablishing, maintaining, and having that relationship with Yahweh. Good, good. And so what happens is this, church, and I'm not saying this is anyone here, but what happens is, is when we come here, 
We're so wrapped up in yeah. loving and running after the things of the world that it takes us some time to acclimate ourselves to get into praise, acclimate ourselves to get into worship, acclimate ourselves to get into the presence and the fullness of joy that comes from serving the Lord. It's hard to do it because we've been so busy running after an elusive sensation all week. Come on. Come on. Wow. Too busy. Too busy. And I'm not against running after your goals. We got a goal setting mastery class coming. I'm for it. But I'm never for it getting so big and so prominent in your life that it diminishes your love for the Father. Never. Never. Oh, you need to put that on the back burner. Oh, God. Okay? So once verse 15 happens, which is what the introduction of this strategic, uh, uh, serpent wisdom, then it starts to get reinforced. So it's reinforced by lust. He says in verse, John writes in verse 16, for all that is in the world, here it is, the first lust, the lust of the flesh. Now let me explain what that is. It's creating, listen, an insatiable. The word insatiable means impossible to satisfy. That's what lust is. Impossible to satisfy. Longing, listen, for that what is controlled by the flesh. Now your flesh is inside of you. So it creates an insatiable longing internally inside of you. So first, notice the order. Notice the order, John said. He didn't say the lust of the eyes. First, he said the lust of the flesh first. You got to get it inside of you first. It's got to get seated inside of you so that it becomes so strong in you. Then the second thing can come about, the lust of the eyes. You start looking for things that satisfies the flesh, what is longing, what you're longing for. In the flesh. That's external. See, Satan is so strategic. My wife says something powerful. And every time she says it, I just get more revelation. She, look, my wife says, same demons, different people. They know, listen, if you don't believe in demons, I really have to start Bible study again. Because <laughs> that is so real. Listen to this, sidetrack, real quick, quick, quick. I go to the to this grocery store this, this week, right? And I got this shirt, this t-shirt, and it says, can I, do you need prayer? Okay, so it says that on the front, and on the back it says, can we pray? And so I'm in the, in the aisle, and the guy comes up to me, he says, man, we gotta pray. And I'm thinking, why did he say that? And I remember I had the shirt on, right? So he says, man, we gotta pray. I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, man, let me tell you, man, where society is now, Boy, we just got to pray. And he started talking about all the things that happened. And we go way back and forth. You know, that's my type of conversation, right? So we're going back and forth. And he's an older guy, about 70 years old. Look good for his age, but about 70 years old. He says, because let, I'm serious, he tells me. He said, I'm serious about this thing because I died and I came back. I was like, really? He said, yeah, man, I was about 30 years old and I was doing something. And something fell on me and I literally died. I went out. And I was in a coma. He said, I died. Then I was in a coma. He said, but the strangest thing happened to me when I was in this coma. He said, here I am lying in the hospital bed. And he said, a man walks into my room. He said, he's a dark-skinned man. And I couldn't see his face. But he was a dark-skinned man. He was real hairy. And he, I'm thinking he's my doctor. He says, come with me. He says, I want to show you something. And I never want you to forget it. So he says, I go with him, and all of a sudden, I'm out of my bed. And he said, I'm looking down on my body in my bed. And he said, then I start going up, and I'm through the hospital roof. He says, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I can see all the cars in the hospital parking lot. And he said, but I just keep flying. He said, you ever had one of those dreams where you're just falling there? And he's like, ah, you know, he said, that's the way I was doing it, but I wasn't falling. I was going up. And he said, as I went up, I saw this great light, and then when I came out of the light, he said, I was on this beautiful hill. And this hill had a road and we was going up the road and I walked up the road with the man and when I got to the top of the road, he said, the man look, said, look at that right there. He said, man, it was the most beautiful house I've ever seen in my life. He said, come on, let's go to it. 
He said, man, I go to the door. I mean, he said, I'm like, wow, this is so good. <laughs> and so he says, man, we get to the door. He said, now we had, we had, uh, uh, we had fries, right? And you know, fries have those big, tall, those are new fries. It has the big, like 20, 30 feet uh, uh, roof. He said, man, the door was about as tall as this roof, but they were beautiful wood doors. And he said, they were thick. And I've never seen wood like this. He said, I put, and I'm thinking, I gotta, he said, go in. The man said, go in. He said, I think I just got to push the door hard. He said, I just barely touched the wow. door. The door went, wow. Amen. He said, in there, this house was gorgeous. He said, there were people working and building the house. And they were building the house. And he said, he took me all around this house. It was beautiful. It was humongous. It was big. He said, literally, we was touring the house for three hours. Wow. He said, and now, it didn't feel like three hours, but I found out it was three hours. He said, and then when we get back to the front of the house, the man says to me, you like this house? He said, yeah. He said, this is the mansion that I'm building for you. Hallelujah. In my father's house, the man said, are many mansions, and this is yours. Now, it's still being built. Wow. It was 30. He was 37. He said, I'm 70 years old. That was 40 years ago. Can wow. you imagine what it's like now? Wow. He said, so I come out of this. He said, so, he said, so, the man says, never forget what I showed you. And he said, also, I'm back in my body. I go, and I wake up. And I call the nurse. I press the button for the nurse. They're shocked. They're running in. They get something happening. He's like, no, no, no. He said, let me tell you what happened. He said, and I'm explaining it to the nurse. And the nurse like, yeah, right. It's some, some of the chemicals, some of the drugs we gave you. He said, no, it's not. No, it's not. And he said, I got to talking to the nurse. And I had a roommate. And he said, my roommate. At the nurse leaves, looks up and he said, he's an older guy. He said, young man, that was a very interesting story. He said, that didn't happen to me. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, they both in ICU. He said, I had a heart attack. I coded five times. He said, and every time I coded, my bed went up, a hole opened up in the ground, and it was nothing but flames and hot air coming up. Jesus. He said, that didn't happen to me. He said, that happened five times. My God. Every time I coded, the bed went up, the hole opened up, and they boom, hit me, and then the bed boom, come back. Five times. My God. Wow. He said, bro, that's what he said. He said, bro, because I told him, he said, bro, you got to let your people know. There is an afterlife. Yeah. And there is a hand. Wow. He said, I'd be more than willing to come to your church and give this a testimony. Wow. I'm saying that to say, if you don't believe in demons, you need to start. Because they are real. I'll break it down in a deeper study of where they come from and all that other good stuff so you can have an understanding of the spiritual realm because Jesus said you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Not in the earthly places, in the heavenly places. And when you read my book, you'll understand how powerful that is, the three realms. Hallelujah. So, Satan, excuse me, serpent wisdom works. This has been working. For centuries. Wow. We just gotta be able to pick it up. Yeah. And no, wait, 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 wait. I'm running after an elusive mm -hmm. sensation. Mm -hmm. Because the third thing is this. This is the third thing. Remember, lust of the flesh, mm -hmm. internal, lust of the eyes, external. Yeah. And then comes the third thing, mm -hmm. the pride of life. Wow. Let me explain what the word what John was writing. The word pride in Greek. This was written in Greek. The word pride in Greek is a hmm, it's boastful. It literally means this. Literally. I'm going to read it the way I wrote it. It's acquiring to impress by showing a, that you possess a greater importance, a greater talent, or your culture is greater. That's the pride of life. That's when we go out and we buy designer everything. Barely can afford it. We buy it though. Why? Because we want to impress people that we are more than what we are. That we have more than what we, the designers clothing says we have. We're here for the pride of life. I don't have to say it. 
me just see what I want to know better than you. You know, my race is better than yours. I better pull back on that one. <laughs> okay. Y'all promise you're going to love me after I say this. Come on, yeah. Come on, yeah. You yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> might want to cut that off if I'm going live on Facebook. <laughs> What's happening in Israel, the Bible says this, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for its peace. For you, those who love the peace of Jerusalem, prosperous. If you understand the history of that region, I'm not going to go through it, but you need to understand the history of that region since 1947, and a little bit before that before you can really take a side of Israel, Hamas, or Palestine. So you know how to pay, pray for the peace Come of on. Jerusalem. Teach, teach. That's what we're called as kingdom people to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're making this into a race war. Come on. It is not a race war. It's true. What it is, because a race war has to deal with the pride of life. One race thinking they're more superior than the other. Yeah. And when we understand the roots and the origins of what's happening over there, you will be able to really understand not only what's happening over there, but also what could possibly happen here. Come on. Come on. It gives you that insight. Jesus. So we can't be drawn in by what we hear. Remember I did that teaching on learning the difference between how to think versus what, what to think? Yeah. Yes, sir. We can't be drawn in by what all these different media sources are telling us what to think. Yeah. Come on. You have to in such a time as this. You have to know how to think. Come on. Come on. Be on the shot. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay on this point just for one quick second and we'll go back. I've been, because, you know, when this, when this all happened, when this all started happening in Israel, I had my initial reaction. I said, no, I, gotta, I, gotta, I don't understand what's, I don't, I don't even understand, I don't even know how it looks, what it looks like on the map. I don't even know what Gaza, where Gaza is on the map. Come on. So I started to look at it, and then I had to go, and I was like, well, geez, that's pretty unique. So I had to go back, and I started studying, I started researching. I start, I start to get a better understanding because I don't want to be drawn in by people's opinions. I want to be drawn in by the righteousness yeah. and truth that's found in the word of God. That's where we have to stand, church. Yes. So as I'm looking at all these different sources and the, what can happen if it keeps going the way it's going, these sources are saying, man, this is a setup for World War Three. Come on. And I don't, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. Am I, am I too deep? No. Oh, come on. <laughs> my wife be like, just go. I don't know if anybody saw my post yesterday on Facebook, but I posted what Albert Einstein wrote. Albert Einstein said this. I don't know what weapons will be used to fight World War III, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. You catch that? Yeah. That's called total annihilation. We have to recognize where we are right now. The Bible says, Peter says in the book, I'm, I'm going to teach y'all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please. Okay. Peter says in the book, 2 Peter, let, let, let me read, go there real quick. Let me go there real quick. 2 Peter says this. I believe it's 2 Peter, chapter 3. Hopefully I'm right. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets, this is verse number two, and that and of the commandments of us, the apostles of, of the Lord and Savior. Now here, let us break this down. Paul, Peter writes, this is the second epistle. Well, right, second Peter. He says, and I'm writing this, he said, because I want to stir up your pure minds. He goes on to say, he said, because 
You know this already. I want to remind you on this. You know this already. I want to remind you, he said, these are words that were spoken by the holy prophets before us and by us. And he says, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking around saying, where's the promise of his coming? Jesus has been saying he's been coming for all, like, 2,000 plus years. When is he coming? And he says, for this they will only forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth remained, standing out of water and in water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Listen, here it is. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire into the day of judgment. So in other words, Peter is saying, look, the other earth got destroyed by water. This time God is using fire. I don't want that to be in our lifetime. And fire, we can understand the power of a World War III, according to Albert Einstein. Church, we have to, like never before, recognize the same season we're in right now. But you got to recognize that God chose you to be in this season because you're strong. Come on. You're powerful. You're mighty. You're courageous. He placed you here for such a time as this because he knew you had what it takes. You have what it takes to shift things, to be the remnant. But you can't do it running after elusive sensations. Come on. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. So let's keep going. The last two. How do you stop this searching for a looser sensation? Found in verse number 17. A second John. Notice what he said. He said, love. First John. He says this. Verse 17. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who, listen, does the will of God abides forever. So he says this. This is how you stop. Number one, be able to recognize the illusion. That means a deceptive appearance that, so that you will no longer be in love with the world. It's an illusion, church. It's an illusion. It won't give you the happiness you, that they say it will. It's just, it can't. It's based on lust. It can't. So that's the first thing. He said, you have to know that's passing away. That's number two. Number two is, once you know that's passing away, then, then fall in love, listen, with the will of God. Yes. Why? Because notice what he said, the will of God abides forever. When you do the will of God, you're setting in motion permanent eternity. It can't be stopped. It can't be denied. It's what God wants for your life in the first place. He don't want you running after the elusive sensations. He wants you running after his will. It abides forever. Then, once you do that, number one, be able to recognize the illusion. Number two, be willing to do the will of Yahweh. Then, let's go to Romans 12 too. We're going to end on this. Romans 12, 2 says this. This is the third thing. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when you're willing to stop searching for the elusive sensation, and follow hard after the will of God. Then your conformity to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh will start to drop off. How does it drop off? Your mind starts to be, notice the word, renewed. Amen. You don't get a new mind. Yeah. You get the mind that God already wanted you to have when he created you in your mother's womb. He wanted you to think like he thinks. You're made in his image according to his likeness. You can have his thoughts. You can have his ability to think the way he wants you to think about what he has already predestined and set aside for your life. He wants you to start thinking like that. Because that's his will. You start to be transformed. When you're transformed, you can't go back to, way, to the way you were before. 
Does that make sense? Amen. And then he says this. It will lead you into this. Completing the good, the acceptable, and perfect will of God. Yahweh has three wills for your life. The first will he always wants to take you into is his good will. His good will is when you experience how good God is. Once, now this is through transformation. It happens as you being transformed, as your mind is being renewed, you start walking to God's good will. You start seeing the goodness of God, even when all the negativity is happening in the world, even when all the negativity, negativity is happening around you, maybe even in your life up until this time when you were searching and running after the elusive sensation. When then you stop that, and you start running for, after the will of God, all of a sudden, you start seeing God's goodness. And you start completing that will. And then God says, okay, son, okay, daughter, you see how good I am. Now, there's some things I want you to accept in your life right now. There's now his acceptable will. His acceptable will is, hey, I want you to leave this person alone and start hanging out with this person. He's like, no, 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 I don't like that person. That person won't accept me. He says, don't worry about it. You know I'm good. Trust me. Trust me. I want you to start doing this and stop doing that. I want you to start doing this and stop doing that. I want you to stop thinking like this and start thinking like that. I want you to stop thinking like that. And start thinking like this. Did I say the same thing twice? If I did, that means you need to do that. But if the bottom line is this. You got to start accepting some things. You got to start releasing some things. Because when you do that, you move into the third will of God that he has for your life. His perfect will. See, we're not ready for the perfect will until we get through the accepted, acceptable will. When you say, God, now whatever you got for my life, I'm, I'm going to do it. It's perfect for me. You know what's best for me. You created me. You wrote all my days out before yet they were one of them. The Bible tells us. I accept it. Whatever I got to go through, whatever I got to do, whatever I got to say, whatever, however you're leading me, I accept it because it's perfect for me. That's the ultimate state of transformation. When you are at that point. I can do all things, as the scripture said. I can face all things through Christ who strengthens me. No more elusive sensations. No more love and lust. Only the love of God and his will for my life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. So, Father God, I thank you. For each and every one of us under the sound of my voice, oh Father, that each and every one of us, oh God, have the ability to achieve your good, acceptable, and perfect will through the transformation that you want to give us, Father, as our mind, as our minds become renewed. Father, I thank you for this. Father, I thank you that we will no longer run after elusive sensations because we will recognize. We will recognize when we're running so hard after the things that are from the world and of the world that it has diminished our love for you. I thank you for this. When Holy Spirit gave me this teaching church, this came very strong in my spirit. And it was this. There's some of us running after an elusive sensation that you think you're going to find in relationships. You're thinking you're going to find it in relationships. Either relationship, primarily relationship with somebody of the opposite sex. Which, nothing wrong with it. But you're searching for the wrong thing. You're searching for an elusive sensation. That, hear me, only God can give you. Only God can give you. And I want to pray for you. If that's you, every eye closed, just raise your hand. That's you. That's you. You can be with friends. You can be with other people, be family members. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those hands that are raised. That they're no longer being held bound searching for a sensation that you want to give them. 
Father, I thank you that you're touching their hearts right now in such a way that you are filling the void of love. You're fulfilling the void of love. And they are now operating from a transformative position because their mind and heart is being renewed. Father, I thank you for that. Amen. Now, with every eye closed, if you have never received Yahshua's atonement on Calvary's cross, which causes you to have the righteousness of God in and over your life. And today you say, Pastor Peter, I want to have God's righteousness in my life. If you want that today, raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. Maybe you once had that relationship and for whatever reason you walked away. We're not concerned about the reason. We are concerned about you. And today you want to reestablish your relationship with God by coming back to your rightful place in the kingdom. That's you. Just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. And the last thing I'm going to pray for real quick is that you know you have had some aspects of your relationship with God diminish. Running after the elusive sensation could be financially, could be with people, it could be with career, whatever the case may be, but you recognize that you have allowed it to diminish your relationship with Yahweh, and you are praying that it will be reestablished like never before. That's you just raise your hand. I want to pray with you too. You raise your hand, just come forward for any of those three. I won't be long, but it will be good. 